Hi again. Just checking out this guitar here, doing some assessment. This is kind of rare, the first one I've ever seen. This is a Gretsch acoustic from the 1950s. It's a 6003 model from 1958. Very much a folk boom era guitar. Very much like a Martin OM too, except it's got a narrower nut of only an inch and five eighths. And the body, which is laminated mahogany, is quite a bit wider than your typical OM. It's, it's close to a four and a quarter thick at its widest point. Sitka top, solid, uh, very lightly braced X bracing, uh, one set of finger braces, one tone bar, and the inside of the top on this is kind of, I got a kick out of it. It's never been sanded and it feels like it's got the little whiskers right off a of bandsaw. Pretty cool. Good looking Brazilian board and that's interesting. It's lost some dot inlays and some of them are actually pushed down below the surface of the fretboard. Nice thick tortoise guard, and it's actually got the mounting holes, including one right through the top here for an old DeArmond style pickup. And the reason it's here is because, well, it's missing a bridge. And it's obviously had a storied history. Uh, something strange happened. There's epoxy residue on here, and I don't know if you can see it, but there's a lip, a mighty lip. It's not just the finish that's been cut back. But the spruce itself, it's almost as if someone took an X-Acto knife, went around the bridge and maybe chiseled out the spruce and tried to inlay it into the top as if maybe they were doing and trying to avoid doing a neck reset and didn't want to maybe shave the bridge. They tried to sink it down in the top. Weird. Um, I put a straight edge on the top of the frets and definitely needs a neck reset. It's only about four millimeters above the top at the front end of the bridge, should be closer to eight or nine. So we're going to do a neck reset, there's money in the budget for that, and we've got to build a new bridge. Um, these are pretty simple Gibson style bridges. Just thinking about how I'm going to do it, I think I'm going to put uh, an overlay on the bridge pad because it's pretty chewed up, it's all you know shattered under here. So I'll put an overlay on the bridge pad in this area. I'll get in there and plug up each of the, uh, the string holes, take a router, I'll cut off the offending epoxy, I'm not going to try to scrape that back, and the remnants of rosewood here. And I'll make a new bridge, and we'll do that so it overhangs the outline by about a 32nd of an inch. Not so much to for cosmetic effect, it's just, I think I'm going to inlay a piece of spruce on top, try to build it back up, and I want the bridge to be slightly wider than that. Um, the other thing is when you do that, I mean there's a stress line right at the back of the bridge. It's not the best way to do it, and in fact the best way would be impossible on this guitar. There's just no way of like inlaying spruce in an economical fashion from the back side. Um, so I'm going to do that. I will inlay the spruce, make the bridge slightly wider. So this is, uh, I mean it's not the most valuable of guitars, but it's definitely a relic, definitely a history piece, and it's a, you know, it's a solid top guitar from 1958. Let's, you know, save it and make it play. I want to hear what this thing sounds like. It's got a lot of play wear. Someone, you know, thought enough of it to put a pickup on it, so that means it's probably a pretty good guitar. I think it's worth it. I'm just using some sandpaper on a flat wooden block to clean up the surface of the bridge pad before I glue on the overlay. This gets rid of any loose fibers or any dirt that's on the surface. The overlay itself is made out of maple. It's about 90 thousandths of an inch thick and I use tight bond to glue it in place. Those two bolts you see there just get run up through the string holes and they hold it in position so that it's not going to slide out of place when I put the clamps on it. After this I will route a channel that runs across the damaged area of those uh, string holes. I'll sink a piece of spruce down in there. This is the first of two patches. After it's dry I'll go back over and uh, reroute the entire area and inlay a piece of spruce that brings it up to the level of the soundboard. In the meantime I'm also making the bridge, planing it and drilling it. You can see that I pulled off the pick guard because it was getting in the way of leveling the patch here. I scraped and sanded it so that it's in the same plane as the top. It's all ready for the glue up. I finished the bridge. I actually forgot to film the portion where I was uh, sanding the wings down on the spindle sander. No big deal. I think you've seen me do that before anyway. The other thing I did was I left off the saddle slot. I will route that after the bridge is glued on and I've got the neck reset done so the intonation I can get it bang on and it won't be off by you know a 32nd of an inch or something which would be very annoying. 
I'm not going to teach you how to do a neck reset in this video, but trust me, it happened. This is some Super 77 spray adhesive from 3M, which is what I prefer for putting on pick guards like this. It's very strong, but it's also got just enough flexibility that it's not going to crack the top uh, in case the wood starts to shrink around the pick guard. It's time to route for the saddle slot. Um, I actually did a stupid thing by gluing that pick guard in place uh, before I routed for the saddle. It's the kind of thing that happens when you've got five or six different or, uh, repair jobs going on at the same time. Not a big deal. Um, I just shimmed up this edge to accommodate for that so it's not going to be the saddle slot's not going to be canted. Anyway this is my jig. It's just a piece of plywood that gets uh, clamped to the body using threaded rod and padded calls on the back side. There's a tray on top that holds my laminate trimmer in position and um, it's adjustable for both the distance and the skew so that I can just mark out for the correct location of the saddle including compensation. Lock it on down route for the saddle and uh, that's it. So pretty low tech, pretty easy. I replaced the missing fingerboard dots and I'm just uh, trying to take a little of the newness off them using some orange shellac. Okay we got some strings on. I went with the light gauge strings this time. There's the bridge. I think that fits in pretty well with the general style of the guitar and it does the job. There's still some weird stuff going on in the finish around it from that uh, that strange repair attempt. I don't really care. Uh, it you know, it doesn't stick out too much, and the rest of this guitar really does show its age, so it's not a bother. The action turned out really nicely. It's five and a half sixty-fourths on the bass, four on the treble, which is comfortable for just about anyone. I think the pearl dots look all right. Uh, they're certainly better than having no dots at all. And the sound of this guitar is pretty remarkable. It's very clear, uh, very articulate. There's good volume, and I think it would compare uh, reasonably with the Martin OM guitar of the period. So that's nice. You know, this was originally, um, it was on its way to the dumpster when the player who owns it now um, encountered it. And he saved it, recognized that it had some value and that it should probably be, you know, put back into order if at all possible. And uh, that's what we did. So I feel pretty good about it. Anyway, I'm just going to play a few chords for you and, uh, and that'll be it for today. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.